The outgoing defense secretary forced to depart now two months early. The president frustrated by the critical resignation letter from Jim Mattis. It's very possible that the shutdown will go beyond the 28th uh, and into the new Congress. And it is day three of the Christmas government shutdown. The sides remain very far apart on the president's demand to fund a border wall. And this, the Treasury Secretary trying to reassure investors after the worst week for stocks in a decade. What Steven Mnuchin told the world about his conversation with the heads of big, ba big banks. And uh, did the president cross a red line venting to his acting attorney general about revelations that implicate him in the Michael Cohen case? Good morning and welcome to Early Start. I'm Joe Johns. Happy Christmas Eve. Happy Christmas Eve. Nice to see you today, Joe. I'll have you all week. I'm Christine Romans. It is Monday, uh, December 24th. It is Christmas Eve. It is 4 a.m. in the East. We begin here with the Defense Secretary, James Mattis. He is now being forced out of his job January 1st, two months earlier than planned. Now, Mattis had announced his resignation, you, you know, Thursday, saying his views were not aligned with his boss. The departure triggered by the president's decision to withdraw U.S. troops from Syria. Acting Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney defended President Trump's decision to pull out of Syria, saying it's aimed at pleasing his supporters. In the next breath, Mulvaney admits supporters don't understand the consequences. He uh, went against the recommendations of Mattis, McGurk, Dunford, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, apparently Pompeo and Bolton. Who is he listening to? Here's, the president listens to a bunch of different people, okay, including the people who... But that's his national security no, wait team. A second, including the people who live here and the, and the ordinary Americans, the people he promised when he ran for office that he was going to leave. We recognize the fact that this is unpopular within the Beltway. We recognize this fact that it's unpopular within the Defense Department. It's very popular with ordinary American people. Do they really know what the stakes are of pulling U.S. troops out and leaving the Syrian defense force to the Turkish, uh, Turkish slaughter and what the impact is going to be on Iran? I mean, really, we're going to make this a plebiscite? Ordinary, ordinary Americans have no idea about those things. They elect the president so that he does. Now, one thing the president apparently did not immediately recognize was that Mattis was resigning in protest once that became clear. Aides say the president remarked Mattis was only being portrayed as the smartest guy in the world because he was leaving the Trump administration. Now, sources tell us, senior... ...presidential envoy for the global coalition against ISIS. He has decided to step down. The president's decision has now been turned into uh, formal military directives. Pentagon officials confirming the executive order for Syria has been signed by outgoing Defense Secretary James Mattis. CNN has, learned, has also learned that days before the president decided to withdraw, he made a crucial phone call to Turkish President Erdogan. CNN's Gul Tuzuz is live with us. Uh, more from Istanbul. What do we know? Well, before that decision by Trump was announced, we know that there was a phone call between Trump and his Turkish uh, counterpart, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. In that phone call, Trump apparently asked the Turkish president, can you handle ISIS? To which Erdogan responded, yes, we can, as long as we have support from you. And it was at that point that Trump said, okay, it's all yours, we are done. Uh, basically saying that Turkey is going to be taking care of the remaining ISIS presence in Syria. But this really leaves the U.S.'s main allies on the ground in the fight against ISIS in Syria in a lurch because Turkey views that Kurdish fighting force as an extension of what they call a terrorist group here at home. So it's really a complicating factor uh, because the U.S. is effectively leaving its main partners on the ground in Syria in a very tough place. In fact, Mattis's resignation came after uh, a statement from the Turkish defense official who said that they would basically bury the, the members of that Kurdish, Kurdish fighting force in the trenches and tunnels and holes that they are digging now. So we're seeing how complicated this is all getting. And effectively, we're seeing the U.S. pulling out of that very vital mission to fight ISIS in Syria and really leaving it up to their Turkish allies who clearly have more pressing priorities on the ground in Syria. Fascinating developments. All right, cool. Thank you so much for that.
And that's really only the beginning of the upheaval in Washington, the third government shutdown of the year, now entering its third day. And right now there's no end in sight. We apologize, but due to the lapse in federal funding, we are unable to take your call. Once funding has been restored, our operations will resume. Please call back at that time. Call up the White House. That's a recording you're going to get. The shutdown forcing about 400,000 government workers to work without pay. And that's not all. Another 400,000 are sitting at home unpaid. A number of national parks and monuments shuttered for the long holiday weekend. One thing uh, that is working, NORAD's Santa Tracker, thanks to more than 15,000 military personnel and volunteers. Incoming Acting Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney says it is possible the shutdown will be something the new Congress tackles. Lawmakers will be seated in early January. Mulvaney also suggested House Democratic Leader Nancy Pelosi may be delaying a deal because she wants to reclaim her role as Speaker. I think there's a, an implication here for Nancy Pelosi's election for the speakership. I think she's now um, in that unfortunate position of being beholden to her left wing to where she cannot be seen as agreeing with the president on anything until she, after she's speaker. A couple of reminders. First, Pelosi already has the votes to be speaker. Second, it was House Republicans who held up a deal to keep the government open. House Democrats were ready to vote and approve a Senate bill, keeping the government funded through early February. CNN's Sarah Westwood has the state of play at the White House. Well, Christine and Joe, President Trump is bracing for what could be a lengthy shutdown that stretches beyond the holidays as he continues his demand for money for his promised border wall and Democrats continue their refusal to fund it. Now, recall that President Trump had initially demanded $5 billion in funding for the border wall, and he said that had to be for the construction of a physical barrier along the southern border. It couldn't just be for border security in general. Now, sources say Vice President Mike Pence offered support for a border security package worth $2.5 billion if it included funding for the wall. That offer came during a meeting on Capitol Hill Saturday with Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, but those sources say Schumer rejected the offer, so the talks do still appear to be deadlocked. Now, Trump has been all over the map when it comes to this shutdown. He first said he would be proud to accept responsibility for it if it was in pursuit of money for his border wall before shifting to blame Senate Democrats, but it's still unclear just how much less than five billion dollars the president would be willing to accept and it's unclear what if anything democrats would be willing to approve because democrats have little incentive right now to negotiate on the president's terms given that they'll be in the majority in the house in just about two weeks christine and joe sarah westwood of the white house thanks for that cnn has learned that president trump has vented to acting attorney general matt whitaker at least twice in the last few weeks about the explosive revelations in the Michael Cohen case, sources say the president is frustrated that prosecutors of the Southern District of New York, overseen by Whitaker, filed charges that made Mr. Trump look bad. Cohen pleaded guilty to crimes he said he committed at the president's direction. None of our sources at the White House say the president ordered Whitaker to stop the Mueller probe, but the conversations highlight how convinced the president is that the attorney general should serve as his personal protector. Uh, that's the significance of it. Also important to note, this is not Mr. Trump venting about looking bad. This is the president of the United States confronting the nation's top law enforcement officer about a case in which he himself, the president, has been implicated. The president's actual attorney, Rudy Giuliani, could not confirm the conversations with Whitaker, but he said the president does view federal prosecutors in New York as out of control. All right, to the markets now. The Treasury Secretary from Cabo San Lucas, where he's vacationing, Steven Mnuchin, spent Sunday on the phone talking with CEOs of the country's six largest banks in an attempt to reassure investors after the worst week since the financial crisis. Last week, the Dow down 6.9 percent, the worst week weekly drop since October 2008. Remember that, mm -hmm. Joe Johns? Absolutely. The September 500 lost 7.1 percent on the week. It's worse since August 2011. The Nasdaq fell more than 8 percent, worse since November 2008. The Nasdaq is now officially in a bear market. In this remarkable statement, after he spoke on the phone with these bank executives, Mnuchin said none of the financial institutions experienced, quote, any clearance or margin issues and, quote, markets continue to function properly. He added, we continue to see strong economic growth in the U.S. economy with robust activity from consumers and businesses. All three major averages are now down more than 12 percent in December. They are on pace for the worst December since the Great Depression. Here's the thing. Two things. One, 
No one ever suggested there was a problem in the banking system with liquidity or being able to fund loans. He actually raised an issue when saying there's no problem in the banking system that isn't even there. So some are questioning what the motive was there and whether that was a rookie mistake. That's just something that's not done in the economy. And also, economists generally don't see an imminent downturn. No one is saying there's a downturn coming. Yes, the blockbuster growth of 2018 is likely to fade. Risks like an escalation of the trade war with China, they loom. Still, market veterans say that a panicky Wall Street is, is prematurely pricing in a recession that may not hit until 2020. Now, adding to the concerns... A source said President Trump has been asking advisors if he has the legal authority to fire the Fed chief, Jerome Powell. Markets don't like this. This is not about how banks are working. This is how the president is messaging his stewardship of the economy. The president has repeatedly attacked Powell for raising interest rates and blames him for the market declines. Interest rates have gone up seven times since Trump took office. Four of those increases have been under (laughs) Jerome Powell. But interest rates are still, what, like two and a half percent? They're still historically very, very low. So why even bring up this issue of Jay Powell and firing him? And, And the other thing is just the question of pure stability. You don't create an issue by talking about it if there's no issue, right? Right. So the idea that the Treasury Secretary is releasing a statement while he's in Cabo San Lucas and the country government, the government is partially shut down, to say that there's not a problem with liquidity in the banks, the CEOs Mm -hmm. have assured me, no one thought there was to raise that. I mean, I've seen a lot of different analogies, but that's, as one mm-hmm. uh, Democratic uh, uh, congressman said, that's like being the, um, the you know, the, the, the water safety people and saying our water is not mm-hmm. poisoned. You know, so, it's like, wh- right. why would you even bring that up? So, so does it really go back to what you said, rookie mistake? I don't know. I think the president needs scapegoats for the market. He has put his own success behind the, the benchmark averages and trying to find somebody to blame if the market doesn't keep going up. All right. Now, a little bit, a little bit of good holiday news today. A quiet but cold Christmas Eve ahead in the east is safe for people who are traveling. But a new storm brewing in the Pacific Northwest could complicate holiday travel. Meteorologist Padram Javahari has the latest. Joe and Christine, good morning to you both. Yes, it is going to be a very chilly start here, but again, quiet for now, and things get very interesting later in the week, thanks to what is beginning to happen around the western United States. But we'll watch for some lake effect snow showers across the favorable areas around the Great Lakes, and even some residual snow showers pushing in towards interior portions of New England, and frankly, that is about it. So as far as travel is concerned on the East Coast, this is as good as a Christmas Eve gets when it comes to the weather pattern with the cold air kind of bottled up towards the north, and notice what happens as we go in towards mid to late week here as we really set the stage for very warm weather to try to push in that'll eventually be about 10 to 15 degrees above seasonal values. But the next three days will go for Christmas Eve about 44 degrees, which is pretty much in line for seasonal averages. And you notice by Christmas Day, right in line for Christmas, uh, seasonal, seasonal averages. And then by midweek, again, staying there as well. The lower 40s, the name of the game. Back towards the west, here comes the storm system that again brings in the wintry weather later on into the week for the east coast but we'll see some snow showers around the higher elevations some wet weather from seattle down towards portland and that's the most uh, impacted area of weather for today 34 degrees in detroit chicago same score new york highs today around 44 degrees guys all right pj thanks for that uh, jim mattis will not be allowed to leave on his own terms the defense secretary forced out two months early his critique of the president apparently too much to bear you can't quit you're fired The outgoing defense secretary forced to depart two months early. The president frustrated by the critical resignation letter from Jim Mattis. It's very possible that the shutdown will go beyond the 28th and into the new Congress. Day three of the Christmas government shutdown. Sides remain very far apart on the president's demand to fund a border wall. The Treasury secretary trying to reassure investors after the worst week for stocks in a decade. But Steve Mnuchin's solution has nothing to do with the actual symptom. And did the president cross a red line venting to his acting attorney general about revelations that implicate him in the Michael Cohen case? Welcome back to Early Start. I'm Christine Romans. And I'm Joe John. It is now 31 minutes past the hour. And we begin with Defense Secretary James Mattis being forced out of the job January 1st. Two months earlier than planned, Mattis announced his resignation Thursday, saying his views were not aligned with Trump's. The departure triggered by the president's decision to withdraw U.S. troops from Syria. 
Acting Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney defended President Trump's decision to pull out of Syria, saying it's aimed at pleasing his supporters. But in the next breath, Mulvaney admits supporters don't understand the consequences. He uh, went against the recommendations of Mattis, McGurk, Dunford, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, apparently Pompeo and Bolton. Who is he listening to? Here's, the president listens to a bunch of different people, okay, including the people who... But that's his national security no, wait a second, Including the people who live here and the, and the ordinary Americans, the people he promised when he ran for office that he was going to leave. We recognize the fact that this is unpopular within the Beltway. We recognize this fact is unpopular within the Defense Department. It's very popular with ordinary American people. Do they really know what the stakes are of pulling U.S. troops out and leaving the Syrian defense force to the Turkish uh, Turkish slaughter and what the impact is going to be on Iran? I mean, really, we're going to make this a plebiscite? Ordinary, ordinary Americans have no idea about those things. They elect the president so that he does. All right. One thing the president did not immediately realize was uh, that Mattis was resigning in protest. He didn't get that right away. Once he got it, once that became clear, aides say the president remarked Mattis was only being painted as the smartest guy in the world because he was leaving the Trump administration. Now sources tell us uh, senior military officials are worried about the uncertainty this upheaval is causing. With Mattis on the way out, who is in charge for now? Here's Pentagon correspondent Barbara Starr. Deputy Secretary of Defense Patrick Shanahan, number two at the Pentagon, has been named by the president to become acting Secretary of Defense. There was a feeling inside the White House officially that they needed to get a new person in, that they didn't want Mattis in a lame duck position. But administration officials will tell you that behind the scenes, the president was not happy with the extensive news coverage of Mattis's departure, of his resignation letter, saying basically that he was resigning in protest over the president's decision to withdraw troops from Syria. So Shanahan now has the leading role here at the Pentagon. He has been involved mainly in things like acquisition reform and innovation. Now, with no foreign policy experience, he will take on a national security role on the international stage, dealing with America's military allies and America's military adversaries. Barbara Starr, CNN, the Pentagon. A lot of moving parts two years into a president's administration. The president's decision to pull U.S. forces out of Syria, leading to another resignation. Brett McGurk, the special presidential envoy for the Global Coalition Against ISIS has also decided to step down early. CNN has also learned that days before the president decided to withdraw, he made a crucial phone call to Turkish pre President Erdogan. CNN's Gul Tazuz, live with more on that from Istanbul. Before that decision was made to pull U.S. troops out of Syria, the Turkish president and Trump had a phone call in which apparently Trump asked Erdogan, what about ISIS? Can you handle ISIS? To which the Turkish president said, yes, we can, as long as we have support from you. And it was at that point that Donald Trump said, OK, we're done. It's all yours. And that, of course, opens up a whole new can of worms in Syria because it really leaves to, uh, the U.S.'s main ally on the ground in Syria in the fight against ISIS in a lurch. Turkey views those uh, Kurdish fighting forces as an extension of what they call terrorists here at home. And in fact, Mattis's resignation came after hearing the words from the Turkish defense minister in which he said, referring to those Kurdish fighters, they will be buried in the holes that they are digging. So yes, U.S. troops are coming home from Syria. But at this time, that very vital fight against ISIS is being left up to the U.S.'s Turkish ally, who clearly has a very different agenda and a different set of priorities in on the ground in Syria. Joe? Okay. Some chilling details uh, of that conversation and what could come next. Thanks so much for that. Meanwhile, the third government shutdown of the year, now entering its third day, and right now, no end in sight. We apologize, but due to the lapse in federal funding, we are unable to take your call. Once funding has been restored, our operations will resume. Please call back at that time. That's the recording you will get if you phone the White House. About 400,000 government workers working without pay, another 400,000 are sitting at home unpaid. 
a number of national parks and monuments shuttered for the long holiday weekend. I went to mm -hmm. Bunker Hill yesterday with my right. kids, two days ago with my kids, and um, you could see the monument, obviously, but you couldn't go into the museum. Weird times. Yep. Uh, we haven't seen something like this yep. around Christmas time in, what, 20 years, yep. maybe longer? One thing that is working, NORAD's Santa Tracker. Thanks to more than 1,500 military personnel and volunteers, incoming acting chief of staff Mick Mulvaney says, it's possible this shutdown is going to be something the new Congress tackles. Duh. Uh, lawmakers will be seated in early January, January 3rd, as a matter of fact. CNN's Sarah Westwood has the state of play at the White House. Well, Christine and Joe, President Trump is bracing for what could be a lengthy shutdown that stretches beyond the holidays as he continues his demand for money for his promised border wall and Democrats continue their refusal to fund it. Now, recall that President Trump had initially demanded $5 billion in funding for the border wall, and he said that had to be for the construction of a physical barrier along the southern border. It couldn't just be for border security in general. Now, sources say Vice President Mike Pence offered support for a border security package worth $2.5 billion if it included funding for the wall. That offer came during a meeting on Capitol Hill Saturday with Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, but those sources say Schumer rejected the offer, so the talks do still appear to be deadlocked. Now, Trump has been all over the map when it comes to this shutdown. He first said he would be proud to accept responsibility for it if it was in pursuit of money for his border wall before shifting to blame Senate Democrats, but it's still unclear just how much less than $5 billion dollars the president would be willing to accept and it's unclear what if anything democrats would be willing to approve because democrats have little incentive right now to negotiate on the president's terms given that they'll be in the majority in the house in just about two weeks christine and joe all right sarah at the white house thank you one final throwdown between president trump and outgoing tennessee senator bob corker the republican lawmaker and the frequent critic of mr trump said this sunday about the government shutdown this is a made up fight so the president can look like he's fighting. But even if he wins, our borders are going to be insecure. The president immediately went after Corker on Twitter, saying that the Tennessee Republican wanted to run again, but his poll numbers tanked after, quote, I wouldn't endorse him. The president says Corker asked for his endorsement and the president said no. Corker pushed back on the president saying, quote, yes, just like Mexico is paying for the wall. Hashtag alert. The daycare staff, remember that quip. A quick fact check. CNN reported when Corker declined to run, the president offered to endorse Corker and asked him to reconsider his decision. All right. The Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin spent Sunday calling bank CEOs from his holiday in Mexico in a bid to reassure investors after the worst week since the financial crisis. First, let me give you the damage report. The Dow fell 6.9 percent, the worst weekly drop since October 2008. The S&P 500 last week lost 7 percent, its worst week since August 2011. The Nasdaq fell more than 8 percent, its worst since November 2008. A really bad week. And the Nasdaq is now officially in a bear market. So that's the damage report. Here's Mnuchin's attempt at damage control. In a statement after that call, those calls with the six CEOs, he said the CEOs confirmed that they have ample liquidity available for consumer business uh, markets and all other market operations. Uh, newsflash, no one thought there wasn't ample liquidity. The Treasury Secretary essentially telling the world that everything's fine when no one said it wasn't. The, the bank liquidity has not been a problem here. Then he added this, we continue to see strong economic growth in the U.S. economy with robust activity from consumers and business. Also true. No one has, no one has said that's not true. All three major averages are down more than 12 percent in December, and they're on pace for their worst December since the Great Depression. The markets are acting as if a recession is right around the corner, which is why the selling just might be overdone, frankly. Yes, the blockbuster growth of last year, this year rather, is likely to fade, and risks like, you know, the U.S.-China trade war are still out there. But some market veterans argue that a panicky Wall Street is prematurely pricing in a recession that may not happen until maybe 2020. But messaging from the White House is not helping here. The president's attacks on the Fed chief raising big concerns. A source said the president has been asking advisors if he has the legal authority to fire his handpicked Fed chair, Jerome Powell. The president has often attacked Powell publicly for raising interest rates and blamed him for the market plunge. Interest rates have gone up seven times since Trump took office. Four of those increases have been under Jerome Powell. As I say, don't start nothing. There won't be nothing. But it looks like trying to start something.
CNN has learned that President Trump has vented to acting Attorney General Matt Whitaker at least twice in the last few weeks about the explosive revelations in the Michael Cohen case. Sources say the president is frustrated that prosecutors overseen by Whitaker filed charges that made Trump look bad. Cohen pleaded guilty to crimes. He said he committed at the president's direction. Now, none of our sources say the president ordered Whitaker to stop the Mueller probe. That, of course, would be huge news. But the conversations highlight how convinced the president is that the attorney general should serve as his personal protector. Important to note, this is not just Mr. Trump venting about looking bad. This is the president of the United States confronting the nation's top law enforcement officer about a case in which he himself has been implicated. The president's actual attorney, lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, could not confirm the conversations with Whitaker, but he said the president does view federal prosecutors in New York as out of control. The Supreme Court appears to be getting involved in special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation for the first time. Chief Justice John Roberts has issued a pause on a judge's order holding a mystery company in contempt of court. We don't know the name of the company, where it's based, or why it's being investigated. Most of this case is under seal. It's been kept secret. We do know the company is owned by a foreign government and received a grand jury subpoena that requires it to turn over information about its commercial activity in a criminal investigation. The company asked the Supreme Court to get involved. Robert's order will give the justices time to decide if they want to intervene. All right, nearly.